very much indeed. It's uh, my first trip for Africa, my first trip to South Africa, and it's very exciting to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I want to review some work about uh, this uh, higher spin ads EFT duality, and I've decided after the beautiful lecture of my the first speaker before me that I should probably also use some slides, but I don't want to go too fast. So I want to use the board, but I don't want to write on every single equation because otherwise the board will get covered uh, very quickly. So what I want to explain to you is uh, the, the ideas behind this uh, correspondence between higher spin theories on ADS spaces and <coughs> theories and how it sits relative to the stringy ads eft correspondence, and that's uh, the direction in which this has been developing over the last few years, trying to understand this, uh, this correspondence in more detail and understanding various consequences of it uh, for string theory and for, for duality. I mean, the, one of the main aims is really to understand the ADS-CFT duality more conceptually, understand really what, what makes it work, what's crucial for it to work, what's accidental to really get to grips. That's, uh, that's, that's a so let me start by uh, just saying something that's I mean, putting it into a wider context but by saying that this is uh, related to the ADS-CFT correspondence. The ads correspondence is one of the most important topics in the realm of uh, string theory for the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, it relates to seemingly different uh, things, namely uh, superstrings or supergravity, the theory on antidesita space, at times in, the, in this specific example, five-dimensional antidesita space in the pi sphere, to a four-dimensional field theory, SUN, super and mills theory in four dimensions. And uh, that is interesting because as I'll review on the next few slides, it gives you an interesting access towards the young Nils theories in a regime that's uh, difficult to access otherwise. And it relates something that uh, is uh, close to the heart of the string theorist to something that's uh, closer to the heart of an experimental physicist. I mean, n equals to four super Nils theory in four dimensions is not quite what's measured at the, at the LHC at CERN, but it's not that far away from what they actually look at. I mean, it's not. They haven't unfortunately seen supersymmetry so far, but it is, it's a four-dimensional field theory, it's a young Mills theory, so it shares many of the features that are relevant for the description of nature, something we, are, we can really be confident has something to do with uh, the world in which we live, and it relates it to aspects of, uh, of string theory, and therefore connects string theory in a maybe slightly different way with the real world than the usual talk about the unified theory of all things. And I think this has been a a really important development and one that has led to many instances. So what's the key behind um, the, the relation between these two descriptions and why is it interesting? So what's interesting about it is that you can relate the parameters that appear on the ADS uh, uh, stringy description to the parameters that appear on the field theory side. And this is the relation written down for ADS 5 plus S5. It doesn't really, the factors of 2 and the powers of 4 don't matter. What's important is that the, the general behavior of how the parameters on the two sides are related. So what's important here is that uh, on, the, on the ADS size you have the, the radius of the 5 sphere, in the case of ADS 5 plus S5, or the inverse radius of, of the radius of the ADS space, which is inverse proportional to the cosmological constant. And that's what's called uh, by this parameter R here. And this parameter R you can measure relative to the Planck size that was also mentioned by here. <coughs> And the idea is that uh, this ratio, or some power of it, is related to the rank of the, of the gauge th that appears on the gauge theory. So it's SUN gauge theory you have in mind, so this N is the rank of the gauge. And the, so, so that's one parameter. The other parameter is the string coupling constant being related to the young Mills coupling constant. And then once you've uh, identified these, then it follows that the radius in string units, that is, so the string unit is a typical measure for the size of a typical string, that's related on the Young-Mills side to the combination the G-squared Young-Mills <coughs> times N. And G-squared Young-Mills times N is not just some random combination of parameters, it's the natural coupling constant that appears in the large N limit of the gauge theory. So as many of you may know, if you study uh, SUN gauge theory at large N, there's a simplification that appears in perturbation theory, and what appears is that the effective coupling constant that characterizes the that the planar diagrams dominate, and the effective coupling constant that characterizes the resulting theory is this combination, G squared Young Mills. 
So this is simply what comes out of this ABS EFT dictionary that comes out of some five brains being put in a, a flat space and then looked at them in, in, in two different ways. So what's, what's, what's interesting here is that uh, the, what one can ask about the regimes in which, one, in which these parameters uh, want to take that out. So normally one would like uh, this uh, ratio to be large because otherwise the space it, one is looking at is of the same size or of comparable size to the Planck length and then all the quantum effects of gravity will come into play. So n, or rather 1 over n, characterizes the, the strength of the, of the quantum nature of gravity. And given our present uh, knowledge, or rather non-knowledge, about uh, quantum gravity, we want this parameter to be large, i.e. the quantum effects to be suppressed. So we're going to look at this typically in the larger limit, although ultimately one of the very long-term aims is that this is going to teach you how to do quantum gravity. And in the context <coughs> that I'm going to describe for you, I think this is a possibility that's within reach now. I mean, it hasn't quite been achieved yet, but I think that's not totally out of the question. But the rough idea is that you want to have this number large in order to suppress the quantum gravity effect of this problem. And then, as I was uh, mentioning before, if you take this number large, then the effective coupling constant is this two parameter. This is the effective coupling constant for a large and uh, uh, gauge theory. So, <clears throat> what you, there's, uh, there's a, uh, yeah, I mean, you want the string coupling constant to be small because otherwise you would have to deal with uh, string loop effects and string loop effects is also something you don't really know how to handle very well. So we want to take this parameter to be large and this parameter to be small for technical reasons and then we can ask what's the, what's the, what's the value of the, of, of the last the parameter. And now there, there, there are two natural regimes. The typical supergravity regime would be where the string is tiny compared to the tiny almost point-like in this enormous space in which it propagates. And what this means is that the radius of the space relative to the size of the string is very, very large. That's what it means to be in the supergravity regime where the string is a, is a tiny little object moving through a big space. So, so this is the supergravity regime. So this parameter is large, but as follows, by virtue of this dictionary, is that the lambda is large. So what this means is the supergravity regime of the ADS description corresponds to a strongly coupled large n gauge. It's large n because we've taken this to be large, and then by virtue of this correspondence, the tooth parameter is large, and the tooth parameter is the effective coupling constant of the young mills theory at large n. So supergravity corresponds to strongly coupled gauge theory, and that is, that's been part of the attractiveness of the ads cft correspondence, because supergravity is something we can do, or some people can do, and uh, it relates it to something which is very hard to do, namely to study gauge theory at strong coupling. Admittedly, only large n gauge theory, only the planar limit, but still, it relates it to a strongly coupled gauge theory. It makes quantitative statements about a strongly coupled gauge theory by virtue of relating it to a calculation you can do, namely supergravity. So that's part of the, 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 the big attractiveness of the ads cft correspondence, part of the many, many applications that have been triggered. Now this is, this is great and good if you are a believer. I mean, if you believe in this dictionary, then, then that tells you what large, uh, strongly coupled gauge theory is like, because you just do the supergravity calculation and it gives you a prediction for a strongly coupled gauge theory. It's a prediction that you can't easily test by any other means. So it's one of these predictions that you can safely publish and you probably will not live to see any contradiction with your prediction. But you have to assume the, the, the dictionary, and there is a, I mean, if you're a believer, then that's great. But if you're a skeptical person, then what you would rather like to do, you would like to understand why it's true, and under which conditions it is it true. Is it only true in ADS 5 plus S5 that n equals to 4 super young mills? Or would it also do without supersymmetry? What's, I mean, people have applied this in all sorts of contexts where there is no supersymmetry. So, they have taken this as a paradigm and applied it in other contexts and made predictions about things that do not have any supersymmetry. And again, it's a pretty safe prediction because it's very hard to prove you wrong. But to which extent can you believe this? How, how general is it? What, what makes it tick? What, what is crucial for it? And what is, what is just uh, happens to be in this specific example? Like so, so if you're a skeptical person like that, you would 
while you appreciate all the power that has gone out of here, you would like to, to understand why the duality is true and what makes it work. So you would like to test it. So then obviously the idea is that you should take this not to be large, because then you had strongly coupled gauge theory, and a strongly coupled gauge theory is very hard to test. So you would like this parameter to be small, so then you can compare it with perturbative gauge theory. But what, what do you buy yourself by demanding this to be small? Well, when you demand this to be small, then also this has to be small, because that's related by virtue of this dictionary. But what this means is that the size of the string is of the same order of magnitude <coughs> as the space in which it propagates, which means the string is not at all a point-like object anymore. It's, a, it's, in fact, a rather large and floppy object. It's essentially, I mean, you can't trust this dictionary totally in the regime where this becomes small, but what it means, it becomes basically of the same size as the space, right? the string becomes a very floppy object. So what this means is that the tension of the string that would have been responsible for making sure that it's a tiny little string is very small. So this is the regime in which the tension of the string is very small. So the tension that the string is, uh, is, is free, is floppy, is free to propagate, and therefore its typical size is not at all small relative. So this is, this is the regime in which you would expect the, the, the dual field theory to be weakly coupled. And this is uh, what people call the tensionless strings. And uh, so that's what you should try to understand on the dual side what, uh, what the ADS, uh, what string theory on ADS in the tensionless limit looks like when the, when the tension of the string goes. And the tensionless limit of string theory has attracted attention before. But there's one important uh, point here, that the tensionless limit really only makes sense in something like an ADS space. People have before tried to understand tensionless strings in flat space because that relates to the high energy regime of string theory and certain simplifications. But it's very hard to say what you mean by tensionless limit in flat space because tension has a dimension and you can't say what it means for the dimension to be small. You can only say what it means to be small relative to another dimension full quantity. And in the context of ADS, that quantity exists. That's the size of the ADS space. So tensionless means is that the tension in the units relative to the ADS size is small. And that is therefore a much better behaved limit than trying to define tensionless string in flat space. Anyhow, so what this suggests is that if you want to deal with weakly coupled field theory, what you should look at in the dual side is the tensionless <coughs> limit of string theory in ADS. Yes. Is there anything then about the tensionless limit in this space? Um, there, there, there have also been attempts to do that, but uh, as you know, the DSCF, or as you may know, the DSCFT correspondence is on much more wobbly grounds than the ADSCFT correspondence. In fact, there, there is a higher spin version for DSCFT, and I think that's the best DSCFT type duality that is known, but um, that is. That is, I think, it's somewhat more speculative than, 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 than ADS. ADS you can even say. So in flat space, could you just think about just how processes, as you said before, uh, you know, involving all energies much bigger than the string mass? Yeah, but, but, then, but then it sort of depends a bit on how you take your limits. I mean, there's no sort of absolute limit of saying what you mean by the tension is limit. Whereas here, there is. I mean, independent of specifying the energies of the external states, you can say what it means to be in the tensionless limit because you have a length scale to compare. And that's the reason, I think, why, why this uh, higher spin symmetry, I mean, this is another reason why the higher spin symmetry works much better in ADS and why all, why all the theory, higher spin theories that have been constructed by Vasiliev live in ADS and why the construction in flat space is a bit uh, delicate. I mean, there are. The higher spin community, I think there are two camps. There is the camp that believes that higher spins also exist in flat space. But I think the proof of the pudding hasn't yet been given. I mean, there has not been written down any, at least to my knowledge, any convincing higher spin theory in flat space. Whereas in the sitter space or the sitter space, it works fine. Yes? Why can't you like, say, start with higher spin, higher spin, pencil less spins in ADS? and then take the ADS radius to the infinity so that it becomes flat space? What I mean, uh, that's, that's uh, some of the things people have tried. But the problem is that uh, these higher spin theories, they have coupling constants that involve uh, powers of the cosmological constants. So certain things start to diverge when you try to take the cosmological <coughs> constants to zero. 
and make make space flat. I mean, there are there are higher spin couplings that are bound that are balanced in dimension by the by, by by the radius of ADS space, and they will they will sort of diverge. And it's not entirely clear. I mean, it's a somewhat singular limit. You can you can try your luck and run with it, but you shouldn't be offended if you bump your head because you are you are doing something sort of on the verge of, of legality. So so okay. So so this is tensional strength. So if I just say this, then you see, in some sense, I'm, I'm just I'm just making big words because. I'm saying this is now small. Previously, I said this is large. I have no idea what to do. Now I say this is small, and now here I have no idea what to do because tensionless limit of string theory means the string is as stringy as it gets. So supergravity you can forget. Supergravity is as far unsuitable a description of this string theory as it goes. So you need a really stringy description. Now stringy descriptions in ADS spaces are hard to get from. I mean that's. It's not, not an easy task. In fact, that's a, one of the things we are currently trying to do is to use uh, wetomino my type descriptions to understand a truly stringy description on ADS space, which is somehow what you need if you want to do this honestly with this. But the idea is that there is a simpler way of, of making sense of this. And the idea is simply that, you see, when the string tension goes to zero, then all the oscillate, oscillation modes become of very low energy because it's very cheap to, to, to bend the string. If the string has no tension, then it costs virtually no energy to excite it. And what this means is that all the excitation modes of the string become go down in mass. And in the limit where the string truly becomes tensionless, all of them become massless. And what this means is you get a zoo of additional massless fields in your string spectrum that you don't normally have. And whenever you have a massless field, you get a gauge symmetry associated to it. So you get some enormous symmetric theory that has a gigantic gauge symmetry and that you could hope to be constrained by virtue of this gigantic gauge symmetry. So this is this idea that in this, uh, in this limit an infinite number of uh, massless higher spin fields emerge and they generate this uh, very, very large uh, gauge symmetry and that you can get an effective description of this very stringy point not truly doing string theory but just using the fact that you get this enormous symmetric theory having all these gauge symmetries coming from it. And the idea is that this, uh, there's a description in terms of, of this Vesilia Pia spin theories that uh, I'll say a few words later on. And the, the, the other way you should think about it is that this is really the maximally symmetric point of string theory. This is really, this is really like, like the standard model before you apply the Higgs effect. This is, this is the place where string theory has all the symmetries that are later broken by giving the string attention. So, if you think about how fundamentally in a hundred years people will describe string theory, you could hope that they would start with the tensionless point and describe string theory as some sort of highly gauged symmetric description. And the usual backgrounds that we are used to would emerge as a broken phase of this uh, of this description where you've given the mass to all of these higher spin degrees of freedom by switching on the tension. I mean, there's this old idea that string theory has underlying it a much bigger symmetry, and what you would hope is that this is the symmetry that you see at this time. So these are yes. but the fact that you know, string theory can be defined in like arbitrary spaces, but as you said, higher spin theory can only be defined in ADS, not in flat space size. Doesn't that imply that you can't obtain string theory in general, full generality from higher spins? Well, I mean, you, I mean, you could you could you could hope that you start with this point and then you deform your you switch on your string tension and you deform your background and the, the moduli space of string theory allows you to go to other backgrounds. But in some sense, you would think that the simplest description of string theory should be to start at the point where it's most symmetrical and then get to the broken phase by doing all the nasty business you are interested in to get to the <coughs> point you're interested in. But when you describe the electroweak theory, you want to you start with the theory before it's broken, and then you put in a Higgs field to give the W boson on the mass. So this is like, uh, this is a, a, an analogy, but uh, you would think of this as being uh, the phase where the where the, 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 Higg, where the, the W boson is massless, and then the string tension is corresponding to the Higgs field that would give a mass to certain of these. So, I mean, this is an old uh, dream, and what you make believe is that this is, an this is a concrete incarnation of this idea. And, if by going to ADS space in this tensionless limit, maybe you discover the biggest symmetry that, that, that you can discover. And I think this is, uh, to a certain extent, true. I mean, 
for the cases uh, that I'll describe uh, later on in my lectures, probably not today. The, you see some pretty pretty big symmetry emerging, and I think this is bigger than the symmetry that uh, the string theory sort of on the face of Okay, so so there's a, there's one small lie in what I've described. So when when you go to this uh, this tensionless limit, uh, so I said you want to have a description in terms of uh, of a Vasiliev type theory. So the Vasiliev type theory is a is, is is much smaller than all the massless fields that you will get from string theory. So there is a so there are two things you have to do in order to really get from string theory to a Vasiliev type description. You first have to go to the tensionless limit to get all of these massless fields. <coughs> And secondly, you have to restrict yourself to a subset of <coughs> higher spin fields corresponding to a subset of fields on the gauge theories. And the reason is that these Vasiliev theories have basically one higher spin, one massless higher spin field for each spin, whereas this, the, 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 the state content of string theory is much, much bigger. And uh, many, many more states will become massless in this tensionless limit. So the idea is that the leading ratchet trajectory, which is basically contains one field for each spin, uh, that piece becomes massless, like many other things as well. That's captured by the Vasiliev higher spin theory, and that's due to the, some bilinear excitations <coughs> on the on the young wheels. So you're not going to get a full young wheels theory being related to the full string theory. You're going to get the leading ratchet trajectory subsector from the string point of view to the bilinears on the field theory point of view. This subsector should describe a consistent piece of the theory itself, and that will give you some, what people like to call a vector-like higher spin CFT duality. Vector-like simply means that the number of fields scales with like n, not like n squared. So you, in a in a full in a full adjoint theory, you're going to get n squared type uh, massless higher spin fields, whereas here you're only going to get order n uh, massless higher spin fields, and these should correspond just to the leading ratio trajectory for the string. So this is, yes. an, is, is there a simple way to see that uh, uh, this higher spin symmetry that emerges is uh, you know, only only relates like uh, the things lying within a rigid trajectory into each other, but not mixing rigid trajectories into each other. It's a it's a good question. I think that's a uh, that's a good question to study, and I think uh, there are certainly regimes where one should be able to study this. So, for example, on, on, on from this ratchet point of view, you can look at which fields correspond to the leading ratchet trajectory, and what you would like to see is that. In this limit, the OPEs of these fields just close among themselves. That would be the picture, and, and that would be an, a very nice calculation to do explicitly, to, to confirm that, that part of the story. But that's what you would expect, <coughs> that, that somehow this closes on itself, just like the bilinears in young mills theory, the free limit closes among themselves. The problem, the main problem with this is that, so I said we've been trying to see this also directly from the world sheet, and the problem is from the world sheet, ADS is hard. So we can do it at the pure Novi Schwartz Novi Schwartz background in terms of Western Minority models. But unfortunately, and, and there is something which you would call the tensionless limit, which is the, 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 the roughly speaking, the level of the SL2 Western Minority model going to zero. But unfortunately, for no value of this level do you actually get massless and has been field emerging. So I think there is a, there's a problem in the sense that when I say tensionless, this sounds, uh, Sounds uh, pretty innocent, but there is a, there, there, there's a footnote and there's some very small fine print, but it's, it's written down here, <laughs> so you can't see it, and unfortunately I can't see it either. So it's, but it's not that uh, if you just go to the Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz background and do what you think you should do, you're going to get ma tens and less massless fields. I think my suspicion is you have to go to the pure Ramon Ramon background, but for the pure Ramon Ramon background, it's very hard to write down an explicit world sheet description. So it's a bit hard to test this uh, concretely because you really have to do this in <coughs> string theory. It's, it's as stringy as it gets, so you really have to do it from the world sheet, but unfortunately world sheet descriptions on ADS spaces are inherently hard, so it's not that easy to really do directly. And this Matsayev Zetlin action does not get Yeah, but the Matsayev Zetlin action, yeah. So this, but you have to massage it to it's technically complicated. It's technically complicated. It's, it's, technically. it's not problem of principle. It's technically. It's technically complicated. Yeah, to really get to this. I mean, the the, the thing I, I have more in mind trying is this uh, Berkowitz Waffer Witten type description ah, yes. uh, in terms of supergroups, but uh, also there we haven't quite managed to get there. But uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm I have on, in mind to try to do. To 
start with something and then float it over one, one second, so you <coughs> can really But it's technically very fine. Yes. But we can still think of all this is. This is all classical strings. At the moment, this is all classical strings. But as, as, I'll, as I'll hopefully convince you, there is, this is more than just words. And, and, there, are, and there are sort of a concrete uh, quantum type statements that, 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 that exhibit that. So, so as, I, as I was stopped in saying this, so, so this slides until now is sort of the folklore. This is the this is the advertisement uh, part of uh, of these lectures, and this is uh, was the advertisement part of these sorts of lectures for many many years. <coughs> and for many many years there was no no meat to this beyond that. So at this stage one would one would say one looks for dualities of that kind, and then from then onwards one would study dualities of that kind, and one would make sure one would never use the word string theory ever again because one wouldn't know how they really sit inside. Now this has changed, and now we really see examples where one, where one can concretely identify the Zillia Pi spin CFT dualities of that kind with pieces of a stringy ADS CFT. So now, and that's what I'm going to explain later in these lectures, probably not today. So, so I think this has become much more concrete than it used to. Now, I was promising something about, about higher spin theories. Now, fortunately, I don't really have to get deeply into higher spin theories because what I'll be concentrating on is, a, is the low-dimensional version of this game. And there, there is a very elegant description of higher spin theories in terms of Jan Simon's theories, where you don't have to get into the nitty-gritty details of higher spin theories. But to give you a flavor, uh, so higher spin theories have a long history. Um, there are fields. So it, you have a field with a, a symmetric uh, a tensor field of S indices, so this is the spin S field, and it has a gauge symmetry coming from some traceless uh, uh, gauge field, but it has to satisfy some doubly traceless condition in order for this to be a legal uh, gauge symmetry. So there, there are three fields, uh, three field uh, gauge symmetries that have been known for a long time in flat space, and then the generalization to ADS is fairly straightforward, but for a long time it was believed that any gauge theory, any theory of that type would be necessarily free. That you can't have this gauge symmetry at the same time as the theory be uh, interacted. And, and these are sort of these uh, coleman mandula type arguments or arguments to show that there are too many symmetries to restrict the S matrix. And it was really the work of uh, Fred Gillen Vasiliev and then Vasiliev who showed that in, 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 in ADS backgrounds or the Sitter backgrounds, you can, you can circumvent these, uh, these no-go theorems and, and find uh, genuinely interacting uh, higher spin theories that retain all of these gauge symmetries, at least at a classical level. So what they did is they wrote, or what Vasiliev then did is wrote down classical field equations that are, 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 are non-trivial and that respect on the classical level all of these uh, all of these gauge symmetries that are outlined on the, on the previous uh, on the previous slide. And the way they, they, they evolved this no gauge theorem is by effectively two phenomena that involve infinitely many fields. And they live on uh, on ADS or the Zitter backgrounds rather than flat space, and that allows you to write down all sorts of higher spin couplings bound, uh, compensated by the cosmological <coughs> constant. So this allows higher derivative interactions, and at least on a classical level, that they seem to be consistent uh, sets of equations of motions that respect all of these states. So this was an important uh, purpose to that these theories exist. And what's what's cool about them is, I mean, this was 1987. That, and, and what naturally emerged was anti de Sitter and de Sitter. So this was uh, long before the ADS-CFT correspondence. In some sense, that's one of the foreshadows of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Because the ADS-CFT correspondence, by the argument I gave, would predict that such theories should exist. And, uh, and, 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 and this was sort of found in a different context than before. So, Starting with this observation that in this limit you would expect dualities of this kind, people looked for dualities of this kind, and it was clever and Polyakov in uh, 2002, and then Setskin and Sandel shortly afterwards, who proposed the first model of this kind, which was a higher spin theory in ADS4, being due to the three dimensional Owen vector model in the larger limit. And there are different versions of this depending on whether the vector models are bosons or fermions, and whether one considers the free or the interacting fixed point. But uh, they, they proposed a number of these models, and uh, it was uh, mainly the work of Bjorn Yin in 2009 that, uh, that really gave meat to these ideas by, by, by checking non-trivially 
that the sum of the correlation functions of the higher spin fields in ADS4 could be matched to the three point functions of the higher spin currents in the Owen vector model uh, in the in, in leading order in 1 over n. So, this was the. So I mean, you, you may know that there's uh, seven years that uh, elapsed from the first proposal to the first uh, real test that convinced people that there is no meat in it. So this is a this is a hard problem. This is a this is really a, a technical masterpiece. Uh, what they have done. This is a, a very non-trivial calculation they did. They managed to extract out of the Vasiliev theory a concrete calculation, something which I think it's fair to say Vasiliev himself uh, hadn't managed to do. I mean, Vasiliev had written down the equations, but he hadn't been able to calculate anything with it. And what they managed to do was to calculate some interesting correlation functions out of it and compare them to the to the new. So this was a, an important uh, motivation for many people that there, there was something interesting happening there. And uh, what I'm going to want to talk about is is the the, the version in, in even one dimension though. I mean, you may notice this was ADS4 CFT3. Maybe you should be interested in ADS5 CFT4. But I'm going the opposite direction. I'm going to three-dimensional higher spin theories and two-dimensional conformal field theories. And I'm doing that because uh, I like two-dimensional conformal field theories. And also because in that realm, you're comparing two things you have under quantitative very good control. I mean, two-dimensional conformal field theories are very good control. Three-dimensional higher spin theories, as you'll see, or maybe you don't see, because I haven't shown you the four-dimensional ones. But I can assure you they are much simpler than the four dimensions. They are much, much more easily described. You have much better techniques to get your handle on them. So in some sense, you have this duality. You have both sides under very good quantitative control. And you can test it, in some sense, much better than you can test in higher dimensions. At the same time, you would feel that many of the qualitative features are also present in this lower dimension. I'm not, I'm not proposing that the world is three-dimensional and we live on the two-dimensional boundary. I'm just saying, if this is true in, in, in these other cases, it will better be also true in low dimensions. And in low dimensions, I can really see what happens. So let's study precisely what happens there. And then, and then that will probably teach us lessons what to expect also in higher dimensions, because the features are not that different. There are a few redeeming features, a few simpler features. It's somehow richer a little bit in low dimensions because some of these no-go theorems don't bite. You have really genuine higher spin theories even uh, with a finite number to degree of freedom. Um, that, uh, that gives you a little bit more power. That's probably, in some sense, another argument to say that you have these theories on the back. OK, so the, the concrete proposal that uh, uh, we, we made some years ago was uh, that, uh, and I'll explain these things uh, that's part of the program for the lecture to explain what these words mean. Is to then a higher spin theory in ADS3. Uh, I'll explain to you what, how we can describe this. Uh, together with a complex scalar field of a given of a specific mass, is due to a certain family, larger and family of uh, uh, minimal model type CFTs, two-dimensional conformal field theories, WNK minimal models, uh, where the parameters on the two sides are related in a specific manner. There's one free parameter here. Parameter <coughs> lambda uh, that feeds into the mass of the scalar field that you can add on the ADS space, and it's related to the two parameters that appear on the two-dimensional conformity theory side in this uh, tooth-like manner, and then the n over n. We shouldn't be worried here about the minus one. I mean, remember in ADS three, the Brighton little Friedman bound tells you that the mass can be negative if it's not too negative. So this is precisely above the Brighton little Friedman bound. Um, so that's the mass of the scalar field you can add, and you get the correspondence of that. So, so unlike the uh, the Kevin of Polyakov, uh, you have a one-parameter family of theories because you have a one-parameter family of higher spin theories on ADS3. There's simply one additional coupling constant you can choose. So that's nice because when you compare numbers, comparing numbers is uh, much harder than comparing functions. And comparing functions, if two sides depend on lambda and you match the function, that's much more convincing than if you compare numbers, because if you compare numbers and you make a num an error of a factor of two, then they don't match. If you compare functions and you make an error of a factor of two, then the whole function just differs by a factor of two. So this is, a, in some sense, a slightly more robust. One should say that, in some sense, this is like a clever enough polyakov in, in specific examples. When you tune this parameter to be la lambda equal to zero, then it's a single sector of a free theory. 
and for lambda equals to one, it's effectively also a singlet sector of a free theory. So it has the flavor of an ON or UN vector model at these special points, but it has a, a whole family of theories in the middle that interpolate between these two. So this is a, a part of the, the vision. So this, uh, this version is, is bosonic, uh, also like Levanov Polyakov. There is a, no supersymmetry here. So in, in, in the realm of understanding what is crucial for ADS CFT, certainly this aspect doesn't seem to hinge on supersymmetry. But it can be tested, uh, certainly this example can be tested in a, in, a, in a great amount of detail because both sides of the correspondence are under very good quantities. So what I'm going to explain to you is how the uh, quantum symmetries match, and that is in some sense going beyond the classical limit. We will see that this will tell you how this works in finite C, which is in, in some sense the, uh, the, uh, the classical limit. And I'll explain to you how the spectrum of the two descriptions uh, work. And uh, that's in some sense just establishing this uh, higher spin CFT duality for all its worth on, on, on the level you can test it. And then towards the end, I want to explain to you how this relates to the stringy ADS3 CFT2 duality that people know and love. And then, depending on how time goes, so I hope to do this in about uh, two lectures, and then in the last lecture I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what, I'm, what we are currently doing. So one of the things we are currently doing is trying to understand supergravity in ADS3 versus 3 versus 3 versus 1 and match it to the dual CFT, and we have some interesting results there that I'll go to. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the plan. Are there any questions about this? So if not, what I want to start with is to describe the higher spin theory in ADS3. And the basic idea here is that uh, you may know that uh, pure gravity on ADS3 you can describe in terms of a chern simons theory. And we have chern simons theory based on the, on the Lie algebra S algebra. This reflects, in particular, that uh, gravity in three dimensions is topological. It doesn't have any propagating local degrees of freedom. And just like a Chern Simons theory, that's, uh, that's the question. So pure gravity is a topological theory. It's not a trivial theory because the interest happens at the boundary. It, it matters very much how, what boundary conditions you impose. But if you ignore the boundary, it looks like a trivial theory. And that has to do with the fact that locally you can gauge away any, any gravitational excitation in three dimensions. There are as many gauge symmetries as there are. Now the idea of this higher spin description is that you replace SL2R by, by a Lie algebra that, uh, that you may call HS lambda, or maybe you should really call it SL lambda. So if you've ever asked yourself what is SL 9 3 quarters, then there is an answer to that. That is a, is a very definite answer uh, that you can describe very elegantly as well. So, the way to describe it is that you start with the universally now looking algebra of SL2. So SL2 are the generators J plus, J minus, and J3. This is SL2 with the commutation relation that J plus, J minus is 2J3. And J3 is uh, J plus, J minus, is plus, minus, J plus, J minus. These are just the usual commutation relations of, okay, I've written them now for SL2. For SU2, maybe I should, have, I should have written it down for SL3 the opposite real form to the real form. So that's the Lie algebra of SL2R. Uh, so now you can, ask, you can look at the universally developing algebra of SL2R. So what's the universally developing algebra of the Lie algebra? So, so what the universally developing algebra is that you have, you have an alphabet that consists of three letters. I've written, I call them J plus, J minus, and J3. You could also call them A, B, and C. And now you're going to write down all the words that you can make with the three letters A, B, and C. But because you have a Lie algebra, you see you have, a, you have commutation relations that tell you that J plus, J minus, minus, J minus, J plus is the same as the two times J3. So using these relations, you see you can use these three letters, but you can always bring them into an ordered form. So if I call this letter A, and this letter B, and this letter C, all the words I can make in the universal developing algebras are words that have a string of A's, then a string of B's, and then a string of C's, right? Because if there's any other combinations of A, B, and C, I can recursively use the commutation relations to bring the A's to the front, the B's into the middle, and the C's to the end. So 
So this is not going to be a super interesting novel you're going to write with this, because all the words you're going to use consist of only of three types of letters, and all the words are of the form a string of A's, a string of B's, and a string of C's. So it's not super interesting, but uh, that's what the universal invariant comes with. It's a set of all of these words, and it's an associative algebra, because if you have any two such words, you can simply put them next to each other, and then apply the commutation relations to bring the A's to the front, the B's to the middle, and the C's to the end. So that's what you call the universal invariant algebra. All the words you can write with the three letters J plus, J minus, J3, modulo the fact that you can use the commutation relations to bring them into it. And it's clearly an associative algebra because <coughs> you just uh, concatenate them and that gives you an associative algebra. So this is an associative algebra. And then with any associative algebra, you can, you can divide by some relation that doesn't destroy the associativity. So remember the SL2R, or SU, it's probably more familiar for SU2, has a, a quadratic Casimir, which is of the form J3 squared minus, I guess, a half times a J plus J minus plus J minus J plus. So if for SU2, this would be, there would be a plus sign here, and here there would be the opposite sign, but who cares? That's an operator that has the property that it commutes with every single generator. That's the, that's the number in each irreducible representation. That's the Casimir. Now the Casimir operator sort of commutes with everybody. So I can simply set this Casimir equal to a number. I can say it's equal to a quarter lambda squared minus one. And if I divide out by this relation, then this associative algebra remains an associative algebra because it doesn't really matter where you impose this relation because this relation sort of passes through all the generators without they noticing. Uh, obviously, this is a number, it commutes with everybody. This is the quadratic Casimir, the quadratic Casimir commutes with everybody. So wherever I impose this relation doesn't matter, the associativity of the algebra will not be So this is an associative algebra. So what's a, what's the, what does the basis of this associative algebra look like? Well, there's the, the no-letter word, this would be just the one. Then there are the one-letter words, this would be J plus, J minus, J3. Then you have the two-letter words. So this would be J plus, J plus, so A, A. Then I can put A, J plus, J3, J plus, J minus, J3, 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 J minus, J minus, J minus. These are the two-letter words I can write with the convention that plus is to the left of three and three is to the left of minus. Now, you see, when I divide by this relation of the Casimir, then the Casimir is basically a relation between this guy and this guy, modulo this guy, right? Because J plus, J minus J plus, I can write as J plus J minus plus the commutator. So the commutator is proportional to J3. So I can also write this as J3, J3 minus J plus J minus minus uh, J3. Uh, so what this tells you is that the Casimir tells you this minus this is equal to a generator of a smaller. So if I count the, the new independent generators, you see I have one generator here, I have three here, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, but I have one relation, so I'm keeping five generators among the two letter words. So now I can do the same with the three letter words. So the three letter words would be J plus, J plus, J plus, and so on. And I have to divide out all the relations that I gain by the Casimir. And if you do that, what you realize is that there are going to be seven generators that are left over. And if you do it for the, with the four letter words, then you would get nine, and so 11, 13. So it goes up like that. So this is, this is a basis for this vector space. I mean, this is a vector space, which is also an algebra. And this basis for this vector space is just given by, by these combinations. Now, whenever you have an algebra, you can make it into a Lie algebra by saying the commutator of any two generators of my algebra is equal to A times B minus B times A inside the algebra. So that defines for me a Lie algebra because you see the Jacobi identity of the Lie algebra is just inherited from the associativity of the underlying algebra from which I get it. So therefore I can simply turn this into a Lie algebra and get a Lie algebra that is defined on these generators. This Lie algebra will de depend on lambda because, see, when you take the commutator, say, of this guy with this guy, 
then at some stage you will have to rearrange and use the quadratic Casimir, but whenever you use the quadratic Casimir, you get a lambda dependence. But this vector space is a Lie algebra, <coughs> and it's a Lie algebra, you call it HS lambda. The C here just corresponds to this generator. This is uh, central, this commutes with everybody, that just goes along for the right, and the rest is uh, called HS lambda. So that's a Lie algebra. So, Maybe a Baroque way of constructing a Lie algebra by going to this universal developing algebra, dividing out the Casimir, picking a basis, working. The stupid question: Why is C? Why is not R? I saw that you started from universal enveloping of S L two R. Oh yeah, but you mean S L two R rather than S L two C? Oh sorry, yeah, it probably should be R. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I'm I'm a bit uh, I'm easy on complexifications of Lie algebra. It doesn't really matter on that level. So can I have a quick question? So the, um, if I if I have a representation of SL two, yes, uh, in a vector space, in a, in a rep where the Casimir was lambda square minus one, basically these are the linear operators representing that you can build by taking uh, the generators of SL two and products thereof. Right. So I mean, uh, this algebra uh, has a representation, as you very correctly point out. If I take a representation of SL two. When the Casimir has this value, then this gives me a representation of this Lie algebra. But this Lie algebra, has, this Lie algebra is the endomorphism algebra in that. But this Lie algebra has many, many, many more representations. Be because suppose you take this representation and you tensor it with itself, that also defines a representation of this Lie algebra. On neither of these representations is of the type you just described. So. There is one very specific representation of this Lie algebra that's inherited from SL2R, or SL2, or SU2, or what have you, and all the other ones are not. And it's a bit of a subtle, like, if you're interested, I can explain this to you in more detail. It has to do with the fact that, you see, in this algebra, this generator, I mean, as a Lie algebra generator, this generator is not the product of this times this. But this generator is not the product of this with this. It's only a Lie algebra. The only thing you know how to do is take and commutate it. You're not allowed, you're not, you can't take in products. And therefore, as a Lie algebra, this structure has many, many more representations than those that come from the original, original associative algebra from which you made. So every representation of, of this associative algebra gives rise to a representation of the Lie algebra, but not every representation of the Lie algebra comes from a representation of the associative algebra. It's very simple to see if you take the fundamental one you've taken and you tensor it with itself, you immediately discover that if it were to come from a representation of SL2R, it would have the wrong value of the Casimir, because the tensor product of two representations with a given value of the Casimir typically don't have the same value of the Casimir, right? The Casimir is something like J times J plus one, and J, when you take J tensor J, you get a two J and 2j minus 1 and so on, and you get all sorts of values of Casimir. So you wouldn't, but on the other hand, for a Lie algebra, whenever you have a representation, the tensor product is also a representation. So, you, so there are many, many more representations of this um, Lie algebra than just those that come from this. And, and these representations will all play a role later on, so it's important that they're. So, so, so this is just some funny way of constructing a, a Lie algebra. And you may be a little bit surprised that I get so excited about it. But what's cool about it is that if you choose lambda to be 9 3 quarters, nothing happens. You just get a Lie algebra that has some funny structure to it. But if you choose lambda equals to 9, but, or let's say you choose lambda equals to 3, what happens is that this Lie algebra develops an ideal. Everything below the dashed line forms an ideal. So any commutator of something above is something below, stays below. Any commutator of something below, something below stays below. So therefore you can divide out by this from this Lie algebra everything that stays below the dashed line, and you're left over with a Lie algebra of dimension 3 plus 5. 3 plus 5 is 8, and 8 happens to be the dimension of SL3. And in fact, you end up precisely with SL3. If you do, if you choose lambda v equals to 4, then you keep 3, 5, and 7. 3, 5, and 7 add up to 15. 15 is the dimension of SL4. If you keep lambda equals to 5, you get 3, 5, 7, 9. That is 15 plus 9 is uh, 24, which is the dimension of SL5. 
So this is, a, this is a construction that works for any value of lambda, but if you choose lambda to be an integer, then it requires a big ideal, and if you throw away the ideal, you get on the nose SLN. So this is the reason in which, the sense in which you're allowed to call this SL lambda, because it's the analytic continuation of SLN for non-integer values of n. You restricted lambda between <coughs> zero and one. In the duality, lambda will only appear between zero and one. Is some, uh, reason, uh, um, <coughs> I think um, I think for generic lambdas bigger than one, uh, probably there's problems with unitarity of the representation theory. But I, I wouldn't want to put my my hand in a better house or anything valuable. But I think there's a there's probably a good reason why only lambda between zero and one appears, but uh, I don't have a deep understanding. Can, can I switch this off? Or is this uh, meant to be part of the entertainment? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not worried that I'm crushed by it, but it's... I would prefer without. But I think you can just switch it off <laughs> if you manage to use this system around. I mean, if it's not possible, I'll just avoid it. So, so the idea is that in order to describe this higher spin theory in ADS, what you do is you take John Simon's theory, not on SL2, but you replace SL2 by HS lambda. HS lambda is an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, and it has generators that, uh, so these generators you call V2n, the, two le the one letter word are called V2n, these are called V3n, these are called V4n, and n runs always, so in Vsn, n runs always from s minus 1 to minus 1 plus s, uh, to minus s plus 1, right? So for 2, this runs from minus 1, 0, 1. So this is, uh, these are these three. This runs from 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. And uh, so, and the idea is that these correspond, to, so this is clearly an SL2 subalgebra. So this will be describing the graviton from the point of view of the ADS3, because if you only were to do SL2 uh, Chan Simon's theory, then you would just get pure gravity. So this is this is just the pure gravity part of it. And then these will correspond to the modes of a spin three field on ADS3, and then this will correspond to spin four and spin five and spin six and spin seven. So this is how you get the theory with infinitely many spins. And the fact that this really gives rise to a theory that has the same uh, behavior as the front star theory was something that uh, was checked in this paper by Anor Gray and Campbell Juni and uh, three other people whose uh, first name is also Stefan, whose first name is Stefan. Um, they, they checked that these uh, Chen Simon's theories really give rise to theories that behave like higher spin theories in ADS. So the, the, the interaction and the equations of motions to leading order are precisely of that. What is asymptotic? Right. So now, so, so, so now we have uh, some, uh, some theory in ADS3. So let's call it, say, a higher spin theory in ADS3. And we've written it as a Chan Simons theory based on HS lambda. <coughs> now, because it's a Chan Simons theory, every solution of this theory is gauge equivalent to every other solution within HS lambda. That's, uh, I mean, it's a topological theory, so there are no, nothing, nothing interesting. So in order to understand where the interesting physics lies, you have to choose it boundary conditions. You have to specify what you mean by boundary conditions. This is also important in order to identify the dual CFT, because it has been long been known that the dual of a chern simons theory is simply a resomino witten model living on the boundary. But it's, it's not true that the dual of uh, gravity on, on ADS is uh, the Vesumino written model on SL2R. In fact, it's meant to be a Virasoro theory. And what happens is that they have to impose a certain boundary conditions to really get pure gravity on ADS3. And what they mean is they, on the, on the dual field theory side, they, they, they lead to a Hamiltonian reduction of the, of the, uh, the Vesumino written model that truncates down the SL2R Vesumino written model to a Virasoro. 
And likewise, sort of Greenfield, Greenfield Soccer Club. Exactly. Greenfield Soccer Club. Exactly. So now here, um, what, what one has to think about is, uh, uh, so a, as I was saying, any two solutions are gauge equivalent. So you have to distinguish which gauge equivalent solutions you should regard as physically equivalent and which you should just regard as being physically inequivalent but being related by a gauge transformation. And the obvious idea is that two solutions that you can relate by a gauge transformation that falls off to become the trivial gauge transformation out at infinity, you should regard as being physically equivalent. These are uh, related by gauge transformations that don't change the boundary conditions. These should be physically equivalent. So the, the, the phase space of solutions, the, 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 the state, the, the, the solutions, the physically inequivalent the solutions are all the solutions. These are the physical, the physical solutions. These are all solutions. Modulo the gauge transformations that fall off at infinity, that are trivial at infinity. So, so any two solutions that are related by a gauge transformation that falls off at, uh, at, uh, at infinity, you regard as being the same physical solution. But there are gauge transformations that are not trivial at infinity. They will generate, they will relate different solutions to one another, and they will act non-trivially on, on the boundary. And that's what you call the asymptotic symmetry algebra. The asymptotic symmetry algebra is the, is the, is the group of gauge transformations, modulo the gauge transformations that act trivially at infinity, because those you would regard as not uh, as as not giving you new solutions. So the asymptotic symmetry algebra is sort of like the the, the, the spectrum generating algebra of this of this phase space, because these are the gauge transformations that produce your new solutions rather than, than the old solutions. Oh, this is probably uh, difficult to know because all of these things are infinite dimensional, but uh, sort of as a physicist you you look at the infinitesimally, so then you don't, I mean you think of it in terms of, I mean it's like the Verosoro group, you, and the Verosoro algebra <coughs> corresponds to diff S1, but uh, typically you're just interested in the infinitesimal piece of it, so you're not interested in the in, 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 in its global property. So what, what people have studied here are the infinitesimal gauge transformations that uh, modulo the infinitesimal gauge transformations that, that are trivial at infinity. And what, have, what you do, if you, and this is the old analysis of Brown and Hano, if you do this for pure gravity, what you discover as the asymptotic symmetry algebra is the Verosoro algebra, two copies of the Verosoro algebra, and that tells you that the that dual field theory should uh, be a conformal field theory, because it has to have an action of the Verosoro algebra that corresponds to the, the spectrum generating algebra, the, the shadow of the spectrum generating algebra. Uh, it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this global aspect shows up in the anomalous dimensions of fields. You know. um, in, even in the virus. <coughs> okay. Let's okay. Let, I mean, but I, I think from the point of view of the symptomatic symmetry algebra, I mean, that may be so that. You, you, I mean, are you saying that the central charge is responsible? No, it's not the central charge, but if, if you have, for example, SL2R, SL2R also has a central extension. Yes. You know, and uh, you can now look at the anomalous dimension of the field uh, with respect to this central extension. You know, and uh, so the you can, uh, uh, from the point of the uh, representation theory of SL2R tilde is not the same as the representation theory of SL2. But you can everything put down back to SL2R at the price of introducing the anomaly dimensions. Like uh, you know in the in the case of from you coming from SU2 to SO3. Uh, sure, sure, but, but here I think, uh, I, mean, I mean here you're dealing, dealing with Verosoro. I mean Verosoro I mean, the global part of Cliff S1, I don't think has a direct influence on the conformal dimensions that are already visible on the on the level of the Verosoro algebra by itself. But uh, anyway, let's uh, let's let's discuss this later. So 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 if you do this for the case of SL2, you just get uh, the Verosoro algebra. And that's the, another precursor of ads cft the old result of Brown and Hano, that the asymptotic symmetry algebra of pure gravity on ads 3 is Verosoro. And that suggests that a dual theory that describes the possible boundary conditions is a conformal field. So now you can do exactly the same thing <coughs> for this algebra VSN, for this algebra HS lambda. And what you get is that the asymptotic symmetry algebra is an algebra you call W infinity of lambda. 
And uh, to give you a sense of how quick this algebra is, I'm, not, I'm going to describe some features of it uh, maybe later on, but uh, well, maybe not. Um, but uh, so, so, so the picture <coughs> so the SL2R is basically L0, L plus minus 1. And when you go to the boundary, it becomes sort of local. These are like the global transformations of the sphere. And it becomes local, it becomes very thorough. So this index uh, runs over all integers. And likewise, for these higher spin generators, these higher spin generators are initially running between S minus 1 and minus S plus 1. And when you go to the asymptotic boundary, to the asymptotic symmetry algebra, they become independently running over all integers. So you get an algebra that's sort of doubly infinite. It has infinitely many S's, S starts 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And for each S, N runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. And for all of these generators, you have commutation relations. So that's the, that's the symmetry algebra that comes out of this. And by the same token as Brown and NO, what you would expect this to mean is that the dual field theory will be a field theory that has this as its symmetry algebra, so it should be a W infinity type conformity. So given that my time is up, so next time what I'll explain to you is that, I mean, this is a classical Poisson algebra, whereas the W algebra that appears in conformal field theory is actually an honest vertex operator algebra, or however you want to phrase it. And what we've shown or studied is how to quantize this, uh, this Poisson algebra and, uh, and, and, and study the properties of the resulting a vertex operator algebra, and, uh, and, uh, and, and there are very specific features that emerge, and that explain effectively our statement that the, that the CFT rule of, uh, of this higher spin theory is uh, in fact uh, equal to this limit. So this is, a, I mean, this is a classical Poisson algebra, and the idea is that the quantization of this classical Poisson algebra agrees on the nose with the large NK limit of this WNK vertex operator algebra, and so we've given fairly substantial evidence in favor. And that gives you a very strong suspi suspicion that the dual is uh, one of these WNK theories or a large NK limit of this uh, WNK. So this is a one piece of evidence. And then the second piece of evidence is the, is the spectrum. The spectrum of the higher spin theory is being matched at least partially by the spectrum of the, of the dual conformity. So these are the, the two things I want to explain. And then I want to explain how you make it supersymmetric and embed it into a duality that fits into string. So that's the plan for the remainder.